Many material things come and go. But the love of the Holy Trinity is eternal. Why would you try to find a substitute? The fact that we have the gift of consciousness, something that goes beyond materialistic explanations, that is a sign of the Holy Trinity's love. The fact that there is immense beauty when there doesn't have to be. The symmetry, the patterns, the colors, the harmony of it all. That is a sign of the love of the Holy Trinity. The stillness and serenity of nature. That is a sign of the love of the Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity loves each and every single one of us, including you. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for you. As if you were the last person on earth. Everyone is here for a purpose. Nobody is an accident. Here, I'll even give you a slice of the Holy Trinity's love in excerpts from Psalm 34. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good and seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The cut of the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out. The Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Amen to that. There's another rather famous Bible passage that says, Come to me, all you who are weary, and I shall give you rest. Regardless of beliefs, I look around everybody and I notice one thing in common. Everybody is searching for something fulfilling. Yet, all too often, no matter how hard people try, they'll try to seek happiness in a lot of things, perhaps material things, but it never quite fills the hole in here. Which is quite odd because you can be the richest man in the world. You can be extremely fit, you can lead a prosperous life. You can be at the top of the food chain in terms of survival of the fetus and still have this hole in there. This hole cannot be scientifically measured. Yet it's there. You're not going to find this hole physically. Yet it's there. Perhaps hardcore materialists will say, stop sensing that. Suppress it. Distract yourself. But that niggly feeling of something missing, whether you like it or not, it's still going to be there. So what is this hole? And why won't it go away no matter how hard we try to satisfy ourselves? The way I see it, it kind of acts like a compass or like a missing jigsaw puzzle piece. Something is missing and we're yearning to find the right piece. And this hole in our souls, as it were, a soul hole, that should be filled by something meaningful. Something that could embody meaning itself. Something immaterial. Something satisfying. Something that everyone is innately trying to go after. Yet most will choose to suppress it. And people can get depressed over this sort of thing. That's why it's not just enough to just live and have a decent life. There's got to be something beyond this life. Otherwise, what are we living for? If there's no meaning, why not just completely wreck everything you've worked up to? Well, let me tell you something. There is meaning. And there are many people who have found meaning. And this meaning comes from a love so profound. It transforms people from the inside out. It's like a parched fountain that's finally being overflowing with so much want water that it wants to spread this water to as many people as possible. 
Now, these other parched fountains may be hesitant to take water, but you need to have the water. It's sustaining, it's everlasting. And there is a love that many do refer to as living waters. And this love is coming back home. This is a dwelling place of the Holy Trinity. This is where communities gather and celebrate and worship the very foundation of love itself. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This meaningful love has helped many people find a meaningful relationship. A relationship which, I won't lie, does involve discipline, but it's a discipline that's meant to change you. This discipline is meant to humble you, make you that in the presence of the Holy Trinity, Average mortals, you and I, we're not the center of the universe. We try to exalt this love on ourselves. But that's not really love, that's ego. Oddly enough, that's what a lot of people accuse God of being. Yet Jesus, who personified God, displayed a completely selfless life, even dying on a cross to pay for our sins. He had a self-sacrificial love. That's the exact opposite of ego, if you ask me. Now, some may say, Ah, oh, I can find some love, all right, with some romance with man and girl alike. Ha <laughs> ha. Let me ask you something. If you're having any kind of relationship where it's very explicitly sexual, even in the most casual of conversations, it's obvious that the priority for sex is seems to be dominant over the need to get to know somebody with sincere love which leads me to ask you a question in a relationship are you really in love with the person or the body are you in love with the soul or just the sex if you're in love with the sex that's not really love that's lust Treating other people like objects as a means to ecstatic ends. Treating people like objects, that's lust. And that rush is going to go away. And you'll be left feeling empty again. However, a loving relationship with the Holy Trinity teaches you real love. A love that disciplines you to look past the body. And even look past the difficulties of the mind. Look into someone's soul. There's a reason people say eyes are the windows to the soul. That initial experience that cannot be scientifically measured. That's your conscience. That's you. The soul is you. You are a soul and you own a body. God has placed you here to go out to love other souls, not other bodies. Because one day, our bodies are going to wither away and we die. But souls last for eternity. God has placed infinite significance in every single one of us. Not just with the fact that we have eternal life, but also purely from the fact that God loved us from the start. Love is the foundation. And by loving the Holy Trinity, you learn the spiritual knowledge necessary to learn to love other souls. Even going out of your way at times, giving to charity. Even something as mundanely simple as holding a door for some people. Letting people go first above yourself. Giving each other gifts. Giving each other food and drink. Confessing truth to one another to build each other up. Let the love of the community build you in return. Always seek the well-being of others. Today, we had an all-age service here at Hilton Church. There was a lot of fun singing and dancing, especially with Chris Watt at the helm. We were reading John 17 verses 6 to 19, and also Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or strand in the way that sinners take. I said strand, I think I was meant to say stand, <laughs> or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, 
which yields its fruits in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. If you look at history at a professional level, you'll see the profound impact that Christianity has had throughout history. You can read Tom Holland, not Spider-Man, the historian's Dominion, or Paul Copan's Is God a Moral Monster, among other scholarly books, to learn more about how much Christianity has impacted culture for the better. Before Jesus came along, women and children were looked down upon as property. Jesus changed that and saw them as equals. Men didn't really take women and children seriously, but Jesus embraced them just as much as he did with the men. People were holding the children back, but Jesus said, Hey, hey, let the children come to me. It's cool. Children are a lot of fun. In fact, sometimes children can be wiser than adults. It's good to take a break from lack of common sense among some adults nowadays, am I right? <laughs> he also allowed women to have their say. Even allowing women to be the first to testify of his resurrection. Now, this might be a bit of a hard pill to swallow, but if you were living at that time, most people would not take the testimony of a woman seriously, which in a sense makes the resurrection testimony all the more convincing. And Jesus told us to love one another and love our neighbors as we would love ourselves. I look around the internet and there are lots of people who would love nothing more than to rant about Jesus' so-called immoral nature. Funny how a lot of people will love to rant about the most peaceful man who ever lived in history. So what's their substitute, eh? Having the ranters be at the center of the universe, and, we, and if we don't apply to any of their wishes, they'll just scream out, how dare you? With tantrums like a toddler. At this point, some of you who might actually be watching this might say, oh, you shouldn't judge them, Callum. That's another thing about love. Love points out things to people. Like, say, for example, someone was going to have a bath. And they were going to have all kinds of electric lights for that bath. I would step in and say, that's a bit dangerous, is it not? The electric lights are going to electrocute you in the water. What if the person told me, how dare you say that? How dare you be so judgmental? You're not being so loving for putting me on the edge and... <laughs> Saying something <laughs> negative about me. Dude, calm down. I'm just trying to protect you, okay? Love protects. And therefore, love has to point things out when things go wrong. Love helps us to take action. Love sees everybody as equals. No silly political presuppositions. Not even any particular conditions necessary. All of us are loved. And the love of the Holy Spirit ought to drive us to a redemptive lifestyle because to suppress the guilt we would feel and to suppress that innate ability to say sorry from the Holy Spirit, to suppress that, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and that's the last thing you want to do. This love has helped others see equals even during times when people saw other people as inferior. Prejudice and secularism caused many terrible events like the slave trade. Yet it was Christians, like the abolitionists, who ended the slave trade. And it was also Christians who came afterwards who set an example for society, like Martin Luther King Jr. We wouldn't even have any kind of moral decency if it wasn't for the foundations of the Holy Trinity. Now, of course, people of differing beliefs will have some objections to what I just said. But I believe my beliefs confined with the truth that can be rationalized. So I'm willing to take on these challenges. Some secularists will be saying, oh, love is just a chemical. Oh, so you're willing to divorce your wife instantly if you're not in the mood for sex? What if love involves putting yourself out of the way to help others? Sacrificing money for charity? That's not going to benefit your survival. That's taking your own chances of survival away. Oh, it'll benefit society. For, but for what means? They might likely die anyway. And depending on the kind of secularist you are, you probably see life as insignificant. Well, if you don't see life as precious, then that's going to 
highly damage the way you perceive charity in the first place. Also, what about self-sacrificial love? What about people who are even willing to die for other people? People who embrace death in prison camps and other scenarios to save the lives of others. That's definitely not benefiting survival of the fittest. Because self-sacrifice is usually committed by those who have the strength to do it. Self-sacrifice contradicts survival. And yet, it is perceived as the most admirable moral trait in history. And it was personified by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. So, love has to go beyond just mere survival. Because what are we surviving for? We can't just survive for the sake of surviving. Love has to be more than just merely about the body. Love has to go beyond that and discuss the effects of the soul. Perhaps there'll be some who are willing to say, love is an illusion alongside reasoning. Reasoning is illusion. Really, then how'd you come to that conclusion? Through an illusion? That doesn't sound rational either. Love has to go beyond mere practicality. It has to be eternal. Because there are some realities that we hold to be real, yet cannot be scientifically measured. We cannot scientifically measure our ability to reason. We cannot scientifically measure why we ought to be moral. And maybe you could explain how, but that doesn't explain why. You can't scientifically measure aesthetic judgments of beauty and art. You can't scientifically judge history. You can't scientifically assess metaphysics like there are minds other than my own. You can't scientifically measure language or truth or numbers, nor can you scientifically measure hatred or emotions. And you cannot scientifically measure self-sacrificial love. Science is a great tool, but it can't explain everything. It's no wonder these scientists can't say anything about meaning using the scientific method. Oh, there's no meaning, they'll say. Well, have you actually tried looking into actual theology and philosophy instead of mixing up the two with science? <gasps> How dare you be so ignorant? You must not study philosophy, only science. Did you come to that conclusion by science? <laughs> You came to that conclusion by... Don't say it! Fa Don't finish the sentence! Philosophy! <laughs> the Christian depiction of love is what everything boils down to. When you take the time to look into philosophy and theology, you'll conclude that this universe could never have made itself. So it had to be a god that made everything to begin with because there's no other better explanation on how everything came to be from nothing according to science. And philosophically speaking, you can't get something from nothing, so there must be an eternal cause. God is the best explanation because he is outside all of space, time, and matter. So if God took the time to create everything with the creation itself and all his angels singing praises of his beautiful, wonderful design and the glorious miracle of him making everything from scratch, then, and this is a question I've often asked in the past, why do he bother making us? If everything was so perfect, then why not just leave it like that? He didn't have to bother with all this turmoil, all this pain and suffering that we human beings by misusing the gift of free will that he gave us to take a bite of that apple from the tree of knowledge to doom humanity to trials, tribulation, and suffering. God is never to blame for anything. We humans mucked everything up from the start. We mucked it up when we tried to be our own gods. And we still muck things up. Before I became a born-again Christian, I did terrible things. Then when I started reading the Bible again, I was convicted. I was shocked. And judging by the evidence, there was no excuse for my actions. And judging by what I've been studying, philosophically speaking, the Holy Trinity is the only thing that makes philosophical sense of a moral standard. 
And I defied it by breaking some of the Ten Commandments, if not all of them. All of us. Every single one of us. Like, like everyone. Everyone. We've, we've mocked up. We have seriously mocked up. Why? I've often asked myself at times, would God make us to begin with? The answer is profoundly simple. God didn't just want to show off his creation. He wanted to share it. My, my. The dots are coming together now. Yeah, a lot of people like to accuse God of being selfish and a monster, but if God was evil, then he wouldn't have bothered making everything in the first place. If God was evil, he'd be so narcissistic. He wouldn't have bothered making anybody because he was so caught up in his ego. God is good. He created everything to be perfect. And since God is good, the perfect creation and the initial phase of everything being perfect before the fall reflects God's glory and how 100% good he is. If creation reflects God's glory, then it's good because it gives us life. It's beautiful. It's well designed. He's smart. He's an artist. He's perfect. He's good. And when wickedness comes along, like Satan, out of pride, Satan tries to make himself above God, but because trying to be above God involves pride, pride will destroy things. That's another thing I've noticed. Whenever people try to let their pride get the better of them, it ends in disaster. Whether it be family drama or even secular terrorism in the 20th century in the form of Stalin, Mao and Pol Pot and Lenin. These men who were so caught up in the doctrine of survival of the fittest that these men killed more people in the 20th century than any religion could ever dream of in the previous 19 centuries put together. That's a, st that's a statistical fact, by the way. I'm not making this up. Oh, what? You like to cherry pick about those crusades? I'm willing to admit that. Because wars after the events of the New Testament would be heresy because it contradicts Jesus' teachings of peace. Oh, and side note. There were battles in the Old Testament because a lot of people sinned against God first through child sacrifice. And, oh, so naughty idol worship. We're willing to admit that those events happened. And we're happy to discuss them in context of what is right. Before Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, anyone who disobeyed God in the Old Testament times had to pay the consequences. God's love pours out in justice. And so now that Jesus has died and paid for our sins, we are called to go out and to bring others to the love of Christ. Our battle is not with flesh and blood anymore. It's with the spirit. And so because Christians now preach peace, Jesus would never have endorsed any of these current wars. Ask yourself this. Why is it that people like me are willing to admit and discuss these issues, yet secularists are very hesitant to mention the genocidal bloodshed done in the name of secularism? Hmm? And I'm pointing this out, not because I hate you, but because I love you. And sometimes love does involve provoking guilt. But that's a good thing, because that in turn can lead people, if they choose to, to repentance. And in repenting, they discipline themselves to become better than who they used to be. And in learning to better themselves, they learn to humble themselves in the light of the bigger picture. And in doing so, they learn to love others. Love is the foundation. Love is what we celebrate about the Holy Trinity. Love is what all those worship songs are all about. Look up any amount of Christian-based music. Chances are 
you're going to encounter one that celebrates the love of the Holy Trinity in some way or another. Even if it's not altogether obvious. Perhaps other songs will point to the perfection of God's design or the values of, of God's justice. Other songs will be a cry out for acknowledging our brokenness and acknowledging that only the Holy Trinity can fix it. This is a love that only the real God can provide. You can't find this God with any other idol. You can't find this love with the idol of beauty, of trying to worship yourself through make yourself look prettier. You can't find this love through the worship of sex because lust and the rush of it is gonna come and go. Which is why short-term pleasures ultimately don't work. The people of the Old Testament certainly didn't find this love through their idol worship. Their idol worship endorsed their selfishness and their self-indulgence. This love has to be selfless. This love can't be found in, like, the occult or witchcraft or Satanism. Because, again, people who indulge in that sort of thing focus more on the self rather than other people. As if they were desperately craving for power. And this love has to be eternal. If, life, if this life is all there is, then what's the point in love in the first place? This love has to be so profound that so many scholars and philosophers will write entire books about it. Recently, I've been reading a book all about love called Works of Love by a Swedish philosopher called Soren Kierkegaard. Some people pronounce his name like Kierkegaard or Kierkegaard, but I'm pretty sure it's Kierkegaard. Although, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Soren Kierkegaard was a founding philosopher of Christian existentialism. He wrote this book all about understanding the essence of love and how love has to be unconditional. I'd highly recommend you read it for yourself because I'm pretty sure Soren Kierkegaard go into a lot more than I ever could with this single video. Oh wow, because there is a hope beyond this life. And in this time of the year, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to help us speak with, in tongues, to enlight the fire in our souls, to go out and share this love to other people, even our enemies. This is the profound beauty of the gospel. It's a message that saves, and it's a message that's meant to be heard by everybody because it is at the very foundation of love itself. Can I get an amen to that? As Christians, it is our duty to reach out to all these peoples in every home, in every nation, every planet. Now, I might contradict myself from time to time, but the point remains the same. We've got to reach out for as many people as we can. The gospel pr preaching is for everyone to hear. So, why not start by sharing this video? You see, this love gives people purpose and meaning and the will to care for others, even to the point of self-sacrifice. I've taken time to look at other belief systems, even secular ones. None of them can quite have the same profound love that's found with Christianity. I know most of you will probably say otherwise, but I want you to reflect. Even if I don't convince you, I just want you to think again about that whole in the soul I was talking about earlier. What's a better substitute to fill that, huh? Especially in the long term. You might distract yourself, but distractions come and go. You need something more sustaining. Something eternal. Something meaningful. Something that would explain the foundation of living life itself. Ask yourself these questions as I end off this video. Where can I find meaning? Where can I find a moral standard? Where can I find the real love that I'm looking for?